Hey, good evening. It's uh, Tuesday, August 20th, 2024, and I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Board of Finance uh, to order. Um, maybe just to kick the meeting off and before we hit on public comment, I just wanted to um, take a minute to acknowledge, you know, our our friend and fellow board member and, and partner in so many things that we did here, David Martin, um, who sat to my left for um, almost four years um, and has served in a lot of other areas of town. He had passed away a few weeks ago. Um, you know, David was a big contributor to this board. He, um, you know, there was never a number he didn't analyze or document he didn't read and I would, uh, argue that I think he was most times the most prepared person I think when we, when we got to this board he did so much um, and so it's I think it's a big loss for this board big loss as a friend big loss to a lot of the other pieces of this community that he touched so maybe just I might ask to take a uh, short moment of silence just so we can think about David and his um, and his family and friends Thank you, guys. So, first item on the agenda, as always, is uh, is public comment. Does anyone want to make a comment from the public? Okay. So, um, we're going to move on to the first section of our agenda, which are transfers. We've got, I think, sixteen or maybe fifteen. Jen, I think we're taking one off, right? Uh, that's in discussion items. Okay. So we have we have sixteen different transfers here. So. We'll run through sort of one at a time. Um, the first is discuss and take action on request for a transfer of $11,923 for Parks and Rec's seasonal and temporary salary. Good evening. Um, for the record, Jen Fave, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, so this comes, this is a, a year-end uh, balance adjustment. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly how this budget was <laughs> was created, um, but we had a shortfall in our lifeguard salaries in that line um, of eleven thousand nine hundred and twenty-three dollars. Um, back in twenty twenty-three, uh, there was a shortage of lifeguards. We were seeing a lot of people um, going to other communities. This was not uh, strictly a Darien. Uh, issue it was nationwide uh, so at that time they did adjust and increase the salaries starting salaries in effort to um, to attract and also retain uh, lifeguards and seasonal staff so there was money that was put in the budget for 20 fiscal year 2024 it was increased but apparently it was not sufficient to cover the actual needs of what what was actually spent um, so what we're asking for is uh, luckily, my predecessor left, and there was a, a vacancy for a couple of couple of months. So there was a balance in the full time salaries. So we're looking to utilize that money um, to cover this shortfall. The balance that was left in there. So and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Any questions? Do we know what the salary was? What, it, what was it raised from from X to Y? Uh, they originally started at around fifteen dollars an hour, and they went up to about eighteen. And they got enough talent at that yes. point? Okay. Yes. And then this year it did go, you know, it bumps up because minimum wage is also increases now every year. Um, so that bumped up a little bit as well. And there was a slight adjustment to the fiscal year 25 budget. So do you think, based on this transfer, we are. Um, Oh, sorry, all this expenditure, was this all 25? This, this was all fiscal year 24. It was all 24, okay. Year yeah, end. so year end of June, June 30th. Okay, so, so in terms of how does the budget look going forward for next year? Or sorry, the current year that the, we're the in? The fiscal year 25. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we may need to try to find money. We may run into a similar situation. Um, so at the end of this season what we'll do is we'll run the numbers kind of where we were and then actually calculate out what we would need to kind of get through the till the end of june um, and see where we stand hopefully it's enough but based on this i'm not sure 
Okay. Any other questions? So motion to approve to transfer $11,923 from the full-time salary account to the beach and court seasonal temporary uh, staff account. Rob moves. Um, Paul seconds. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Four, zero. Jen, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I don't believe there's anything else nope. on here for Parks and Rec. So thank you very much for coming. Good night. Good night. Okay, next item is discussed to take action on the request for a transfer of 13201 for Registrar of Voters, um, seasonal and temporary uh, salaries. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kara Gately, the Registrar um, of Voters for Town of Darien. Uh, my co counterpart, um, Susan, was not available to be here tonight, but um, I'm here to answer any questions. Basically, um, budgeted, we normally budget for one electoral event. There's often two or more. And now with early voting, with the extension of voting days in person ahead of each electoral event, it requires additional staffing, right? Absentee vote, if you vote early via absentee ballot, you're mailing them in. And um, town clerk staff will handle that. When you're voting via the early voting process in person, has to be fully staffed. Um, we did staff to the minimum required by the statute, which required a moderator um, and then three additional people. So we had that minimal staffing. Um, so for fiscal year 24, that would have been the presidential preference primary, which had four days of early voting ahead of it. Um, so right staffing with those people plus training them for um, those four dates plus the electoral event staffing all the poll sites and all the other expenses. Um, we did offset part of it with use of the early voting grant that, um, that the state um, sent each municipality um, in the state of Connecticut, regardless of size, every town and municipality got $10,500. So we used um, the majority of that grant um, to acquire additional technology that was needed for the requirements of early voting. Uh, people have to be checked in electronically into the state central system, so we needed to acquire additional laptops and computer equipment to allow for that process. The remainder of the funds from the grant we used to offset some of the staffing costs that where we had the overages, um, but then we also needed um, an additional offset intra de department, though. Okay. I guess maybe similar to the question we had at Parks and Rec is the. Um, <laughs> In terms of the early voting and the additional costs that we incur, was that baked into the fiscal 25 budget, or do we think parts of it were? So we we did, but right, we um, did not anticipate having a primary in August with seven days of early voting. We we did you know bake into the budget the 14 days of early voting ahead of the um, November election. Um, but so we did increase seasonal staffing budget, but I don't think we anticipated just how truly expensive the staffing would be for early voting. Right, so it'll be the seven days plus the 14 days. And right at the time of budgeting, we didn't know, right, we knew early, we knew early voting had passed. What we didn't know was the guidelines at the Secretary of State's office, you know, they have the jurisdiction and the power to interpret the statutes. And so their handbook and their guidance of what it has to look like, how you have to staff it. Um, so for the presidential preference primary, we had to have a Democratic group of staffing and a Republican group. Um, for the single uh, primary in um, August, we just had to have one group. Um, for November, for the 14 days while it will, you know, we won't have to have a democratic mind, like it's not two separate events, but we anticipate we'll have to, you know, gauge what we think the crowds will be like. It was pretty low turnout for both presidential preference primary and the August primary, um, but you don't want long lines. So we probably will try to staff, you know, higher than four, um, but we don't want to go overboard and have people sitting around and have to send them home or be, you know. So, you know, we're going to gauge what we think turnout will look like. It appears from the first two early voting events that we had, first day, 
there's a big hit, and then it tapers off. And then maybe a midweek day again later on, and then it tapers off again. So I think we'll, we'll see if that trend and, and try to staff accordingly. Got it. But we'll okay. look for um, you know, areas within our budget, maybe in printing or in other areas where we can offset again. Here and and we, they say there may be additional funds coming from the state. Um, I'm not super certain about that. And there is, of course, um, there are um, private grants available for rural metro areas. Um, Greenwich has previously applied for them, obviously. If we were going to go that route, I think we would go to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance in advance of applying for that, um, show you our proposal, and see if you're comfortable with us going to um, private groups um, that are looking to fund metro rural areas, which we fall into the definition, but um, not wanting the optics, you know, wanting all of that above board and transparent, we'd probably come to, um, you know, the respective bodies before we moved forward with that. Obviously, we have no guarantee of getting it, but um, we know other towns have gotten it within hours of applying. Got it. Rob, how much was the state grant? Last year, it was $10,500. Stanford, New Haven, Waterbury, Hartford got $10,500. Stanford, uh, Darien, Torrington, <laughs> you know, Bethany, you know, so regardless of size of municipality, everyone got the same amount of money. So, de right, benefited us. Um, Still didn't cover all of our costs, but certainly didn't. We'll probably make a drop in the bucket for larger cities. How much do we anticipate being over budget in this current year? I would, I would think probably around eighteen to twenty thousand, if not more. And that's just going on what we think <coughs> we'll have to staff for the fourteen days leading up to the November election. Thank you for staffing all that. I mean. I'm done. guessing you're, you're not being paid for all those extra days. We my gosh. Yeah. We've been able to staff. We have a lot of dedicated poll workers. Um, 14 days uh, it will be difficult to staff, but okay. we'll get there. Well, I think you know we obviously need to pay this. I think maybe kind of looking forward to budget season. I think this is an example of something that you know if it's going to be higher one year than. You know, versus the last. Yeah. If it'd be good to be able to track like how much of the increase in the budget is due to new laws that have been passed. Yeah. If we've increased voting from we had seven days factored in, and now we're 21 between all three events. I think just understanding kind of what's changed there, what's driving, it'll be helpful. Sure. Yeah, you know, I know. Jen was really helpful because she gave us an additional code so that we were able to track all of the voting expenditures that we related that we tied back to the grant. Um, so we do have all that data, and then we have, you know, what, you know, staffing and everything else, you know, once we don't have that grant anymore. But we we're able to, you know, tie everything to, you know, and we've been coding things specific to early voting so that we can track that. Okay. Any other questions for Kara? Thank okay. you. Thanks Thank for you. your time, everybody. Thank I appreciate you. it. Okay. So I'll. Uh, Entertain a motion to transfer thirteen thousand two hundred one dollars from the professional services account to the seasonal and temporary uh, staffing account. Taylor moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Gets unanimous. Four zero. Okay. Next item is. Jen, is this the replacement we have? Yes, you have a revision on the um, police overtime. After the discussion at Board of Selectmen last night about the large balance left in the electricity account, uh, the department took another look at it. We realized that a final invoice um, hadn't been charged to fiscal 24. So this revision accounts for that. We're reducing what we're able to transfer from electricity, and instead we're going to um, make up that difference from software maintenance and support. And Captain Mastrian is here to answer any questions about the purpose Captain, of the you want to give us a just cool. kind of quick update on this? Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, Captain Andrew Mastriani. Um, requesting this transfer, obviously, to address the deficits we have in two of our overtime accounts. Uh, one's for patrol, one's for our communications, which is our dispatchers. Um, this is largely due to staffing shortages we experienced pretty much throughout the entire fiscal year. Um, 
some of which completely out of our control. So, uh, for instance, we had six patrol officers out on injury leave, uh, one of which was basically out the entire year. We had a probationary officer resign right at the start of the fiscal year. We had a retirement. There was a few promotions that went on and some reassigning of personnel. Um, I'd just like to make note that we did hire several officers throughout the fiscal year. However, some of them required police academy training, um, and that basically extends their training to about six to eight months before they even see the road. So there's vacancies that you know, go unfilled um, with a new hire up to eight months. Um, also, our communications, our dispatchers, we're down two dispatchers currently. Um, we did hire two dispatchers, however, that was short-lived. Uh, so for most of the fiscal year, we were down two dispatchers. Um, now, with all these factors in, into play, um, it led to an increased amount of uh, basically shift vacancies in each division, patrol and communications. And a lot of these vacancies need to be uh, filled, and most of the time it's mandatory due to contractual obligations. So over time throughout the years, it adds up. Now, I'm requesting the transfer funds, as you can see, through a number of accounts, most notably from our communications full-time salary, because as I mentioned, we pretty much were down two dispatchers the entire fiscal year. So we had two salaries that went unspent. So a large amount of the transfer will be coming from there. Um, there are several other accounts, for instance, the patrol holiday pay account, we have additional funding, and that is due to officers choosing the holiday time off in lieu of the holiday payout. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, our professional standards, which is our training division, we typically budget for four academy sheets each fiscal year. Uh, we only sent two officers to the academy because um, we hired a few officers that were transfers from other departments. So we had some leftover funding um, <clears throat> in that account as a result. Um, one of our, uh, our annual calibration fee for one of our devices uh, that serves for the accident investigation team ended up being less than what was budgeted for, so we saved some money there. Um, and as Ms. Charneski mentioned, we had some leftover funding from the electricity account. I could really only speculate as to why. Um, i doubtful that rates went down that much to have that type of surplus. Uh, it could be due to all the work that's been going on and perhaps our system's running more efficiently now. Um, but, and um, in the last account, which we added our software maintenance and support, we had some leftover uh, funding from there, and I believe that's because of our new CAD software program. Um, that was rolled out in the middle of the fiscal year, so I believe that maintenance contract ended up being less expensive than our previous one. Okay, so on the, um, I mean, the significant amount of turnover on the uh, on the dispatchers side. I mean, you know, part of why we instituted that that whole program was right to be able to save a little bit of money mm -hmm. with not use have to use a full time officer there. But it seems like it's been it's been it's been I mean, turnover like, to to get them at full strength. Yes. Yeah, like the ten years. Well, do you have an idea? Like generally, what's the average ten year? Do you think within that position? <sighs> It's really hard to tell because it's still kind of fairly new. Um, if I had to guess, um, some people make a career out of it. Yeah. Um, lately, that's not been the case. Um, it could be anywhere from five years to 20 years. Okay. It's really hard to gauge that. Okay. Well, may maybe in connection with you know the next budget cycle, one of the things we could just look at is just getting an idea of just sort of a, a track year, maybe what the average turnover per year mm -hmm. has been on that, and if we've been know. stuck at about uh, seven dispatchers, so we've been too short for quite some time. That seems okay. to be like our our sweet spot, just having seven. Did we ever get to nine at all, Captain? We so did technically, we did. yeah. Technically, at one point, we did have two new hires um, in training at the same time, so that technically brought us to nine, but they never completed the training, so. It was never fully operational. And do you know what the current headcount for just regular patrol is? Uh, currently? Yeah. Uh, yes, we have 51. 
51? We have one in the academy, um, when we had an officer actually just resigned last month, unexpectedly. When you look at, are we looking at 53? Does that sound right off the top of my head? Correct. Okay. Uh, beginning January 1. It's so funny because I think, you know, I've done the police budget for a while. We always seem to get to the number, and then we always seem to kind of back, yeah. you know, and kind of like backslide a little bit, lack of a better word. Lately, it's, it's definitely it's been, been much more challenging. Yeah. Uh, we, we do our best to, to recruit people, both patrolling and dispatchers. Yeah, it definitely feels that way. It's just, it's rough. And it's not a Darien thing. You know, this is a common problem throughout the country, is retaining. I know when Chief was here, we'd almost sometimes poach other, other towns for people, and it's just... And it, we're fortunate it enough where, yeah, we get officers from other departments. Right. If officers were to leave here, usually it's to switch a career. They don't go to other departments, so we're fortunate to have that. Well, we might be able to cut back on a little bit of the need if people locked their cars and didn't leave their keys sitting on the dash, I think. I don't see an end in sight. <laughs> That's just the public service announcement. Yeah. Right for, the, a, for the 12th time. Cost all this, but... <laughs> Okay, any, any other questions for Captain? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, I'll accept a, um, a motion to transfer a total of 182575 as as outlined in these seven different categories to a combination of patrol overtime and communications overtime in a the same amount of 182575 Rob moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. <coughs> okay, next item is discuss take action on request for a transfer of $113,046 for accrued leave redemption. Um, seems like we're here before you every year for this one. Um, we budget a little bit low. We had a budget of $200,000 this year. We have bumped it up in recent years, but when we have a long term employee retire, they sometimes have a very large accrued payout. Um, those are dwindling because we have closed the door on sick leave payouts. We've gotten um, quite a few people down to just a five-week payout on vacation. So these numbers should be going down, but we do have some legacy employees that will continue to have significant payouts. Um, so this year we did have one that totaled 145000 out of the 313000 that we actually paid out, um, so they were close to half of that. The other item that's in here is the um, sick leave exchange that was put into the police department contract, I think, two years ago. I think this was the second year, um, but we didn't have any experience with it when we put the budget in place, so we guessed it. We were close. I think we had budgeted um, around 70000 and it ended up costing us about 82000 so the fiscal 25 budget is in a better position because we have some data on that. Um, but we're looking to move from some other employee benefit accounts that had small surpluses. Um, Social Security was a large one, and we've adjusted the way we budget that beginning in fiscal 25. We're trying to tighten that down because we do historically have a pretty sizable surplus in there. And, you know, while these transfers happen every year and they're, I mean, they're lumpy and unpredictable and so forth, I mean, they're large, but are they large enough that we should ever think about having some type of creating a reserve and a fund where we, we fund it from that rather than, than surpluses or? So that idea has been kicked around a few times. Um, at one point, the idea was we could put out, you know, reserve some fund balance and use it for that, but we'd rather that fund balance all be considered unassigned. It helps us with the ratings agency, it gives us flexibility. Um, we've kicked around the idea of increasing the budget because we know that this is one that tends to go over, um, but we also then tend to have savings related to the retirements, and that, that we fill at a lower position, we have some time when they're not on the health insurance, um, some salary savings sometimes, so we've kicked around those kinds of ideas, and I think that this is actually the best approach. We're not taxing for it. We're covering it with already budgeted dollars. We're not tying up fund balance. So 
it's know, not material. Well, every year we're back before you for a transfer, I think it actually makes sense. On a net basis, it's one. not material enough where it's really changing. Right. Really do deliver services, so. Any other questions on this? Just a couple of questions. So the entire uh, accrued leave is all police related? Um, right, the one, we had a couple of small other payouts when people <clears throat> separated from service. Are the other accounts we're taking it from, Jen, are they all poli are they police related or are they just They're general just ones? They're general uh, centralized employee benefits. Okay. And my second question is, so we got the large one for the amount that you talked about. Does that mean we were under on the other ones, like from a accrual basis, I guess? You mean on where we're transferring from? No, I mean, you got the large one for oh, 145, yeah, the, right? So the 145. And the whole total is 113, so we must have been under on one to. The whole, to the, we spent a total of 313. Okay. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> it's a little different. Thank you. Jen, in terms of the accounts that are coming from, you said like the medical insurance and life and AD and D, those are just sort of centralized. centralized do we have sub accounts where, like, for medical insurance, do we track medical insurance within the police department budget, no, public not. works, or other? But we do track salaries. Yes. We don't allocate the um, insurance expenditures to the individual departments. Um, it changes every year based on tiers of coverage, who opts in, who opts out. Um, so we've had the approach for as long as I've been here and long before to just centralize it and not allocate it. And so does that show up in terms of fixed, like I think general government fixed overhead? Yes. Okay, any other questions on huh? it's Okay, uh, entertain a motion to transfer $113,046 from the five accounts listed here to accrued leave redemption. Rob moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. These are why our August meetings are so highly attended, it's right? Fascinating the, the transfers. Stuff. Especially the ones for nine hundred ninety-five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and Jen, I mean, maybe just for the public, a lot of these transfers, some of like the surpluses and so forth and, and, and shortages, that was generally most of this was kind of baked into the overall net surplus that we thought was going to come out of the Board Correct. of Selectmen budget and go into like, general funding carryover, right? Correct. So, so while there's a lot of money moving around, the net of this was used, but we determined what the mill rate should be, how much we should take out of the general fund bond and all that. Okay. So number five here, discuss and take action on request for a transfer of $955 for senior transportation part-time salaries. We pay the salaries for the at-home and Darien drivers, and we estimate their salary in the budget. Um, they had an approved rate increase that was a little bit more than what we had anticipated. So we're looking to move the $955 from our part-time salary or our employee salary increase account where we budget um, for increases over to their part-time salary account. Okay, and Jen, remind me, do, do they reimburse us? They do. They reimburse us the cost of the drivers and um, the gas and um, things like car washes, unemployment insurance, okay. or unemployment so, claims. So is there a revenue behind this? There is. Okay. So this 955, we're getting it back from them. Okay. And then only to be technical here, the total say 995. Oh, thank you. And is it 955 or 995? Can nine? you approve 995 just in case it's 995? Yep. <laughs> I had to put my glasses on to see that one. So entertain a motion to move $995 for an employee salary increase account to the part-time salary account. Rob moves. Taylor seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, number six. Um, discuss and take action on a request for a transfer of $36,732 for general property and crime insurance. 
So this is mostly a result of our higher than anticipated premium um, renewal for cyber insurance. It was actually 20, almost $28,000 more than we had anticipated in the budget because it jumped up significantly over what prior increases had been. Um, then there was a little bit of an increase for flood insurance and for general property insurance. Those were about $4,400 each. The good news is that at the time of the fiscal 25 budget development, we were able to get an actual number for our cyber, so we knew what it was. So the fiscal 25 budget actually has that in there. And the rate of increase is not nearly the same as it was the prior year. Jen, while these numbers aren't necessarily material increase, I mean, they're large increases, but are we doing everything in terms of to try to keep that down just in terms of because I just took mine this morning, your like annual cyber, cyber training and so forth that you need to go through? Yep, we've um, instituted some trainings, multi-factor authentication. Um, I, so IT has been involved in putting in place all those things that make our insurance company happy. Okay. Okay, so motion moved 36,732 um, from the three accounts listed to the general property and crime insurance line item. Paul moves. Rob seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, seven, discuss and take action on a request for a transfer of $654 for probate planning. We share the cost of the probate court with um, New Canaan, so they re reimburse us for half of the cost, but we have no control over their spending, so we do our best to estimate it in the budget. Um, but when they have new requirements or need to spend money, they do. And we we're under by six hundred fifty-four dollars, so we're looking to move six fifty-four over to cover the rest of the probate expenses. So the, the probate court does it exist here in Darien? Yes, right, right next door. Okay. So, like, do all the funds? I thought all the funds flowed through sort of Darien, and we just got reimbursed from them, or had, like? Yeah, we pay all the bills. Um, and then we we bill New Canaan twice a year for an estimated overhead cost as well as one half of the actual expenditures. Got it. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I take a motion to move six hundred fifty-four dollars from office supplies and contingency to um, printing for the probate. Taylor moves. Rob seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Four nothing. Uh, next, A, discuss and take action on a request for a transfer of $6,035 for a copier lease. So we um, centralized the copier leases townwide. Um, they're all paid out of the administrator's support services account. And mid-year there was a change <coughs> to our copier lease. We um, entered into a new agreement that now includes printer support and maintenance. And as a result, the cost was more than we had anticipated. Or should I ask, are these all capitalized too, or no? The lease is no. Okay. But we do get to report it for DASB. Okay, any Yay. questions? Yay. <laughs> to you. Um, if this is an increase over what you expected, sorry, what was the original budget, $52,000? I mean, we looked at a lease versus by strategy on copies? Um, the town administrator looks at that. I don't think, I don't know when the last time was that it was looked at, but um, we hit the copiers pretty hard, and I don't know really how much useful life they have at the end of the leases. I'm thinking so much is paperless now, but we still we're using. We it a lot. have to print a lot for records retention purposes. Okay. Okay. Entertain motion move six hundred thirty six thousand thirty five dollars from these four accounts to the copier equipment lease account. Paul moves. Rob seconds. All those in favor. Four zero. Finally, we get to Mr. Gentile. Just <laughs> waiting. Okay, nine. Discuss and take action on a request for a transfer of two hundred twenty thousand two hundred sixty-three dollars for public works solid waste disposal services. Here to yeah. talk about this dirty job is yeah, yeah, Jen Tyler. Jen was doing such a great job, I didn't know she was going to just keep going right through it. Uh, uh, 
the record, Ed Gentile, Director of Public Works down at the Ariane. Um, I, the first one you're looking at is the transfer for the solid waste disposal services. And I almost wish we could save this one for last because it kind of puts everything together in, in perspective, if you will. But um, we'll, we'll talk about it now. Um, this transfer right here is to cover the increasing cost for the additional MSW that we saw come into our transfer station this year. Um, I budgeted for about 33, 34,000 tons. Um, I'm sorry, 3,300 tons. And uh, we ended up with 5,100 tons of MSW coming in. So straight calculation at 118 or $103 um, dollars per ton, we ended up with uh, a $200,000 deficit in this, in this account right here. <coughs> so with all of the surpluses I had in accounts, um, plus the small amount from the Board of Finance, I'm able to balance this transfer of $212,000. Um, I can tell you that this upcoming year, um, I did not plan for 5,100 tons to come in again. Um, most likely, if this trend continues, uh, I'm going to be shortfall again on this. The good part about this is we did up our rates about a year and a half ago for the um, MSW coming into our station. We now charge $118 a ton. Um, we see an, uh, an a budget, um, sorry, a revenue um, overage, if you will, of um, close to three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, FY twenty four, um, because of the increase in tonnage. So, um, I anticipated about four hundred thousand dollars in revenue. We saw seven hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So, that's it. Like, what's driving this? I mean, if it's if it's we're charging commercial, sort of we're weighing them, right? Mm -hmm. So, is this all sort of just additional resident use? Uh, no, this is the haulers bringing their garbage into our facility from out of town, right? Uh, it's supposed to be from town. Some from town. Um, or most right, of right now with the way it generates the revenue for us, I, you know, I'm not going to be particular. We they are supposed to be coming in from Darien, but the haulers have been restricted on where they can go now. Uh, Wheel of Brader in Bridgeport has shrunk their list of people that they'll take from. Um, city carting on Taylor Reed um, runs out of space on occasion by noontime, so there's no place for the garbage guys to dump. Um, I think this is a, also a convenient spot. We're right off of I-95, um, and uh, you're in and out of our facility quite quickly if you're dumping. So um, not big haulers. City carting uses our facility also. When they run out of space, they bring the garbage here. They dump it. They pay us, and they take it away. The, you know, the following day or two days later. So I guess the commercial side of things, right? There should be a revenue offset. If the, if their volume or, or mass is going up, we should be collecting more revenue, right? And on the residential side, we have a fixed permit for like X dollars, right? So correct. We saw we saw we saw the increase in revenue the, this past year of almost three hundred uh, three hundred and ten okay. three hundred twenty thousand dollars. Or the hauling prices are probably going up next year. Yeah. Yes. But well, this oh. has been it's been in place for about a year and a half now. The <laughs> increase in rates. Yeah. So, but the re, now with the new recycling charge that we have going on, you may see a charge for that mm -hmm. from your hauler if you have they pick up their your recycling. Is there any reason our facility can't handle it, or is it wearing us down faster now that we're using it so much? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Um, is there any reason that our facility can't handle the? high volume or is getting beat no, up or worn we're, down because of it? We're we're handling the volume just fine right now. Great. It's good business, right? Like we're it's it's a good business model that I kind of fell into. Yeah. Um I did not anticipate that. But you know, when you raise the price and the haulers go, I'm gonna find another place and look around there there really isn't a whole lot for them to choose from. And yet tell me again what we're charging versus what we're paying. So it's one eighteen. I think you said 118, no. and we were paying this past year, we we're paying 99 to have it yeah. taken away. 300. So, so we were making $19 a ton. 20% cross market. Thank you. Take it public. <laughs> well, okay. It's, 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 his request for transfer is offset by yeah. the revenue, the revenue yeah. in the package. Yep. And Jen, is this ever, given the volatility in this, is this ever something we should be setting up a special revenue fund for if you look at, like, and having commercial payments and 
and um, dump stickers go into a revenue fund and then have it feed this? We had a waste management fund years ago. Um, it's probably worth looking at again. I don't know if we anticipate this type of situation continuing. Mm -hmm. The last couple of years when it has occurred, we've been able to cover it within the budget without having to go for special appropriation, whereas with like the rec programs, the number was so large that we couldn't cover it within the budget. We had to go for a special appropriation because we just didn't have enough on the expenditure side to cover yep. it. Um, I don't think this is as bad, and I think it's getting more and more of a handle on it. Each year, he's catching up a little bit more and reducing that delta. <laughs> well, but this, this is a quantity increase, you said, from like 300 to 500? 3, yeah, about uh, 3,300 to 5,100, about 1,700 tons of additional that wasn't anticipated. Yeah, which is almost 50% increase, right? Correct. Yeah. That's crazy. 46. And I think, close. I think we've had the same situation two or three years now. We did. We did. Um, and then it dropped off a little bit, and now it's, it's picking back up again. Um, I, I wish I could tell you, I could look at the numbers now and kind of give you a ballpark, yeah. but during the summertime is not a good time to try taking garbage tonnage and try to predict it over the rest of the 10 months. Um, I'm going to need about six months to see what that looks like. Um, I started to notice this in January, and I saw the shortfall that was coming. And you could see by a lot of the accounts where I drew money from, I had surpluses, it's because I curtailed certain activities until July, um, where I would normally spend in May and June. So without a special revenue fund, the alternative would have been halfway through the year to appropriate a couple hundred thousand dollars right. from the general fund, right. right? And then we would have ended up with a bigger we sort of... Exactly. Yeah. And it would have come back into the... As opposed the to scraping it out of a bunch of different funds. So right. maybe it's something to watch in terms of whether it should be... Mm -hmm. So any other questions? Good. Okay. Accept the motion to transfer $220,263 from the seven accounts listed here to the... Solid Waste Disposal Services account. Rob moves. Taylor seconds. All those in favor? For nothing. Or I should say unanimous. Not football season yet. <laughs> okay, 10. Discuss and take action on a request for a transfer of $13,735 for public works. So uh, this transfer here is. Um, in the waste management section, professional services, it is the um, credit card charges that we take on every year for buying the RDA stickers. Um, this this money, you know, though I may I budget a certain amount, there there was an overage in, or an increase in usage this year, and for uh, for this transfer, I'm going to need thirteen thousand to cover that. This happens just about every year, and I keep trying to chase it. Can you repeat that? It's an overage because of credit card There are credit card charges that are placed into professional services for our purchases for the RDA stickers and our haulers paying their fees. So any credit card charges we get, the fees are this amount right here. So, so if you buy, oh, sorry, Jim. So uh, if you buy your dump sticker online, hmm? we talk on those charges? The, not the $50, but the credit card charge from right. the, no, no, the credit card company. Correct. So it's like what three percent or something on fifty bucks? The buck that that's a lot of. A lot of RDA stickers. stickers. Yeah. I thought this. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the haulers yeah. themselves pay their are now allowed to pay their um, their invoices with their credit cards. That's new to this. Maybe just because we this is a, something we've been trying to keep a track on. Mm -hmm. Maybe without doing too much work, if we could maybe look at is this a quantity issue? The number of dump stickers went up by thirty percent, or is it a cost of processing that went up? And then on the hauler side, I mean, we're making it, I say we're making, we're charging them 20% more than what it cost us to haul away, but we're still running a transfer facility. You have to pay for people and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But um, just think about whether that, that, that should be baked into that price. Is that just, is that higher just because the quantity of people paying credit cards, the haulers has gone up? I, I think it's also, it's part of the fees that also gone up also. Right from 50, from forty to fifty and one twenty to to one fifty, and the holders now are coming in more often, as you see by the tonnage going up. So now they're paying with their credit card on those too. 
So I, I saw that in, the increase started um, midway through the year. It feels like it's. Yeah, I think the, the biggest driven. impact on this is that the commercial haulers, beginning in the middle of the year, were able to now pay their bills, which some of them are twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars in a month. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the dollar amount coming from the commercial haulers is was going to be event. exceeding the uh, dump stickers. If you, yeah, sure. and it's that wasn't yeah, anticipated with when the budget was no. put in place. No. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay. Except the motion moved thirteen thousand seven hundred thirty-five dollars from traffic marking devices and facility repair to professional services. Rob moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Number eleven. Discuss to take action on a request for a transfer of eight thousand four hundred ninety-eight dollars for public works tires. So uh, I normally budget every other year to replace. Um, we have two loaders. We end up replacing four loader tires at, in rotation. Um, just so happened this past year, though, we blew out two of them in one shot. Um, ended up between towing costs and the tires. Um, that was the big item that pushed me over the budget for the uh, budget number for this uh, for this item right here. Um, you see, I had some. Additional funds in snow removal from our railroad stations and hazardous waste disposal. So, that those numbers to cover the uh, shortfall in the tires. Okay. Questions? Okay. Accept the motion to move eight thousand four hundred ninety-eight dollars from those two accounts to tires. Taylor moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, 12. Discuss to take action on a request for a transfer of $5,068 for Public Works Motor Fuels and Lubricants. Right. Um, as you folks are well aware, I handle all the fuel commodity for the town. Um, we saw a, a very small increase in the unit price uh, partway through the year, and then um, there was just a small increase in the fuel usage to put me over that. This budget item usually runs around. Um, uh, hundred and I'm sorry, two hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars. That small increase showed up, up in five thousand dollars. Was there a specific piece of software that we just did not use that kind of let caused that that first account to to be unused? So, um, some of our build of uh, building software, which is the um, that handles the HVAC in here. Um, the new contract is, is reduced. It was, it was a smaller amount than uh, the previous years. And our facility um, maintenance account, our tracking account, um, there was no charge this past year. Okay. Okay. All those in favor of transfer of $5,068 from these three accounts to motor fuels and lubricants? We need a motion. Oh. Huh? We motion. need a motion before we call a vote. Yes, there's a entertain a motion, sorry, to transfer five thousand sixty eight dollars from these three accounts to motor fuels and lubricants. Pillar moves, Paul seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Discuss and take action on a request for a transfer of five thousand eight hundred and fifty four dollars for public works highway facility repair and maintenance. So um, you may be aware we did some work over at the garage on one of the um, about four or five bays on the east side. Um, while we were in there doing the work as part of the contract, we came across a couple of things that I wanted to fix. Um, those are some smaller items, but the, the big ticket item was between our uh, scale house and the swap shop, we put a line of, um, of vegetation in, if you've seen them, the new bushes in there. Um, there. That was actually the big ticket item that actually pushed this budget number over. Um, but uh, for safety reasons, um, it was either that or a fence, and I felt that the the bushes made more sense and it looked a whole lot better when we were done. Okay. Entertain a motion for that transfer. Paul moves. Drop seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Discuss to take action on request for a transfer of $23,907 for public works motorized equipment repair. As 
this is uh, the maintenance for our fleet, so larger trucks, the cars, the town hall vehicles, and everything. Um, some of the um, some of the increase in costs that, that brought me over this budget number was we do get um, vehicles from the police department, um, and what we've been trying to do lately is get them up to a certain standard when they're passed down. So they that includes um, decal removal, painting of the vehicle, and any interior work that needs to be done to make it a little bit more presentable, um, which could be center consoles, could maybe some seats, re, re, uh, um, having them redone or repaired, if you will. Um, so those costs, and we, we, you run around two or three vehicles, it gets up to about two, two grand a piece. So I'm, up to, I'm spending that on the vehicles now that uh, I didn't have budgeted for uh, previously. Um, I'll work that more into the budget now we, as we plan to do more of that. Okay. Questions? Contain a motion to move $23,907 from these three accounts and motorized equipment for repair and <coughs> maintenance. Okay, we moves. All seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Almost there to discuss take action on a request for transfer of 13198 for public works building facility repair and maintenance. Okay. My final one for tonight. Um, this one is for the Town Hall, Mather Center, um, 701 Boston Post Road, uh, EMS building. Um, what we, the big, the big costs that were not anticipated, one of them was uh, we had to make a couple um, major modifications to one of the boilers this past fall. Um, and we did do some major work on one of the rooftop units and you folks did approve some funds for that. But to get it to continue to work, I did have to bring a vendor in and keep it up, 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 keep and I'm sorry, <coughs> keep it running. And um, we had to change some of the condensers. So it was a regular, ongoing, weekly thing just to keep the building um, so that we kept people in it working during the summertime. So um, those additional costs that showed up here now. And when we're doing work on a building like that, like something major, when we're, when we're tracking in, in the, on the ledger, are we tracking it by, do we track it by building? So we track the total of how much we're spending in terms of capital upgrades and so forth by actual facility. I, I don't. A question. Yeah, I, I don't no. do that. No, um, the capital, the capital money I spend on buildings, I do track that. But through the operating fund, any facility maintenance and repair items um, that come in, whether they're two thousand, three thousand dollars, those are those are the ones that are driving this drove this budget up a little bit higher than it should have been, which was bringing a vendor in. To repair the AC unit now. Now he found the problem. He fixed it, but as of course, when he when these older units, it's okay. I'm going to fix it, but you're going to need to replace X. But this will hold for a while, and that's what we are running into. Um, for a couple of weeks, we had large fans in the hallway just to keep the cool air from one end of the building and getting it down to the other end. And um, I, I think that was more for me um, understanding what. Uh, what the environment is like for for our employees here and making sure that it stays workable you know you can't work in 78 79 degree temperatures in this building okay any questions okay. entertain a motion to move thirteen thousand one hundred ninety eight dollars from these three accounts to the facility repair and maintenance account Taylor moves Rob seconds all those in favor unanimous Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ed, I think we're going to, um, were you going to talk a little bit when we get down to the Gorham's Pond? I, I am going to be here, but I, I brought Darren. Oh, he's, okay. We're going we're to talk about okay. it. Uh, we'll both do it together. Okay. But, uh, he's going to lead. Okay. So the, the last transfer here is discussed to take action and request to reallocate certain appropriations within the ARPA fund and the reserve fund for capital and recurring expenditures. Right. So we have one project that was approved in ARPA, the NHFD joint and mortar repair is appropriated at $87,000. We have um, realized that this, it, while it needs to be done, it is just not going to get done within the ARPA timelines. Um, it's been bid a couple of times. I think one time the bids were astronomically high. Another time, I think we had two respondents, but it was clear that they really didn't grasp what work needed to be done. Um, so we're just not able to get a good bid on it to even get out to contract and be working on it. So what we'd like to do with this transfer request is close out a couple of ARPA projects um, and 
basically swap funding for moving the joint and mortar repair over to the reserve for capital non-recurring. And we identified um, about $76,000 of fiscal 25 RFC MRE projects that are either straight purchases or be, can be quickly bid, and we want to put those into ARPA um, because they can get done. It's, you know, we're, we're looking to maximize how much of the ARPA funds we use. So we want to get joint and mortar out and put these other ones in. I'm wondering why you don't throw in the balance for like the bridge repair that we're going to talk about later and just get it done because you only have a few months left, right? Yeah, but there's considerations with that. Um, we've talked about even maybe doing the paving, but one thing that we have to make sure is that on things like that, when they're bid, they meet federal bidding requirements, which are sometimes different than our bidding requirements. Um, so we'd have to look back on how it was bid, make sure that it would meet those requirements. Um, but in September, basically over the next month, I'll sit down with every department and tell me, give me your spending plan for every bit that's left. When is it going to go out to bid? When do you anticipate you'll get the contract? How long is it going to take to actually complete it after that? And so in September, we'll come in and if we can put it all into close things out and say those aren't going to make it or they're not needed and put it into one or two big projects and get those going in the fall to have enough time to get them to contract by December. And Jen, what's the, what's the definition of obligated by December 31st? Um, contract signed. So we have to have contracts yep. signed. Order placed, that kind of thing. And we have to be specific. So if we say that on a particular project we have $10,000 obligated and it only comes in, we actually only spend $9,000, we you know, so we can't over obligate yeah. with then thinking that we can move it around. It has to be. Um, we got to spend by 26? Yes. That's all right. Well, thank you for doing the work to get you know, all the other stuff organized before the end of the year, <laughs> or as much as you can. And I didn't check behind, but how much do we have committed at this point? Uh, I think I want to say we have like 1.3 million unobligated. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll get to it. So, Jen, just so I understand kind of what we're doing here, if you look at the the projects where that were, were done, like the signage and the auditorium upgrades, mm -hmm. we're obviously taking, we're reallocating them to other ARPA projects, right? Yes. But in terms of those that were no longer funding with ARPA, like the renovation of 206, that's coming out and that's not being funded with anything else. Right. Um, so that's just not moving forward at this point. So we're, we're closing that one out. The funds are going to remain available in ARPA, and we're not looking to appropriate from anywhere okay. else at this time. But with the, as you said, in the joint repair, we're taking that out of ARPA, and then we're moving over dollars from the Board of Finance Reserve. Right. We need 10500 from fund the Board of Finance Reserve. Yeah to make up the difference between what we could identify could move out of RFC and RE. That totaled about 76.5. Actually, that totaled exactly 76.5. I'm sorry, why aren't we using, we're not using the 15,000, we're gonna use to renovate 206, but we're also not using it for anything else? It is, it's, this is all just a net oh, okay. amount. Um, so, so the only thing I didn't understand is like the hose replacement. We're taking 30,000 out of the reserve fund. But so that's what's, throwing the numbers off. So there was two years of hose replacement. Um, so if you look on the second page, first page, we're taking 30,000, closing out 30,000 for NHF, NHFD hose replacement um, because that was what was budgeted for fiscal 25. But in the attempt to use up some more ARPA money, we're actually going to appropriate 60,000 for NHFD hose replacement in ARPA because we split it over two years. They originally requested 30 and in the, or 60 and in the budget it got split 30 and 30 for 25 and 26. So we're going to pull that other 30 forward. Um, but it doesn't free, that 30 doesn't free anything up in RFC and RE. Got it's it. Nice. Okay. So should we do two different transfers? One transfer of, of items within ARPA? Yeah, you could. Or, or we're really just reallocating within ARPA and then we're transferring 
Right. You're transferring a total of 200 to 98.19 between RFC and RE and RFI. And I think you can just say as presented, yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion to transfer $106,500 from the four different previously allocated ARPA projects to the four new ARPA projects allocated on this page. And within the reserve fund for capital and recurring expenditures, we'll transfer when out transfer eighty seven thousand out of those five accounts mm -hmm. and into a single account for the Rhone Heights Fire Department joint mortar repair. Rob moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. So in terms of discussion items, the first is number 17, discuss take action on the request to appropriate $78,554.50 from the opioid settlement account to program expenses. Um, do you want to go? Do we? I don't yeah, think Mindy Chambrelli, the director of health, was going to be here, but she got called away for an emergency. Um, so she did send me what her script was. So I'm going to read to you what her talking points were. Um, so she's asking to appropriate the total amount of funds received to date from the opioid legal settlement program. This is part of a multi year payout from the litigation brought by state and local governments. There are seven nationwide opioid settlement agreements from pharmaceutical companies to big box retailers like Walmart, CVS, Walgreens. So far, the town has committed 40000 to support a teen talk mental health counselor position at the middle school for this year um, because it's been well received and successfully implemented at the high school. The idea is to pilot it at, the middle, at Middlesex for the upcoming year. The town support was offered with the understanding that it would decrease, we would decrease our share of funding in the future um, with the goal being for the BOE to fully take over the program funding if it's effective. So the op opioid settlement, we're going to get funds for the next, I forget if it's 10 or 20 years. 18. Yeah, it's extensive. And there are approved uses. You can use the funds for treatment, for prevention, or for other strategies, um, which supports supporting greater access to mental health services is one of those allowed uses, um, supporting evidence-informed programs and curricula, and support um, treatment of opioid use disorder and any co-occurring uh, conditions. Um, so what we're looking to do as of the time, I think we got one more payment in after we put this together, but at the time we put this together, we've received $78,000. We've committed to spend $40,000. Um, Mindy, being new in the position, is working through what plan she wants for the remainder of the funds. But we're asking to appropriate all of them so that when she does have a plan, she can work with her commission, she can come to the Board of Selectmen, whoever it might be, but doesn't have to go all the way through the appropriation process for the remaining 38000 It will already be appropriated and she can use it. And then when we have another round of funding, we'll come back in the next year and appropriate as the, the funding comes in. So is this effectively, so the 40000 I guess, let me, let me step back. How many years of receipts is the 78000 Is that per year or is that the first two years? That's the first two years. I don't think it's two complete years. They've come in at, at different times, but it's more than a year. Okay. And, you know, I, I've read a bunch about this in terms of the uses, right? Like, have we explored any potential uses that could be used in and around the opioid problem in town? That I don't know. Um, the previous director of health was the one responsible for the grant, and I don't know how far he got with developing a plan for those those types of services or those types of programs. Um, but that's one thing that Mindy will be working on is how do we most effectively use these funds. Do we have a schedule for how our contribution is going to go down? Sorry if I jumped in. Well, I think, as I understand, because the Board of Ed announced like four months ago that the town had made this grant before the Board of Selectmen had even approved it. So I think <laughs> maybe that's another issue that need needs to be looked at. But I guess. The $40,000, is this going to be a grant to the Board of Education? Because the, the well, I think we're paying the provider. I don't think we're paying the Board of Ed. I, I forget exactly 
how it's work, how it's going to work, but it's going to fund forty thousand dollars of that position for the upcoming upcoming school year. <coughs> And so will that expense fall on a town side or will that f expense fall <coughs> on the Board of Ed side? Ours is just going to be a, a grant payment out. We're not going to have any ongoing, we're not doing the program. We're saying here's your $40,000. You guys run the program and pay the bills. Yeah. So, and, and John, maybe, I'm not sure if you guys discussed this, I missed your meeting, but is there, I mean, if the Board of Ed is setting up this program, I guess the assumption is they're probably going to do it for more than one year. Is the intention to every year take a certain amount and fund it? Because I, don't, I think the first year the Board of Ed is not paying for anything. Some's coming from this grant and some is coming from the community fund. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to think about, you know, what is this going to look in the, in the ensuing years? Yeah, they didn't have funding set up for this. And when the community fund came in with a grant, they asked, if the town would actually support that to help the middle school program get started. This is not an open-ended long-term commitment on the town's part. And frankly, the idea of using opioid funds came from David. Uh, it was not our idea. And he said, look, this is a good way, albeit indirect, to try to tackle some of these problems given the success of the program in the high school. Uh, we had a presentation actually in this room that involved David as well as the community fund and it seemed like a reasonable deployment of those funds to try to get that program started. But the intent would be that um, the Board of Ed would take this on. The community fund's got a declining annual support for that. I forget what the schedule looks like, uh, but they'll, yeah. to try to get this going. But ultimately, just like at the high school, that's gonna be fully a Board of Ed expense. Yeah, I think, I thought they committed to maybe two or three years. Yeah, it was something like three years nice. stops. Okay. Doesn't it say that our, our commitment was also gonna be declining? Yes. Do we have a <coughs> schedule for that or not? Not that I'm aware of. So and in terms, so how, how much of for, 40 is going, will be a grant to pay for this? Mm -hmm. And is the remaining 38 also going to be used for this or is this going to be used for other No, it would be used it's for un, other things. undeployed. We don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, it has to be within the guidelines that we talked about. Which right, the allowances. Right. And yeah, we're but, sure like this fits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yep. just, we just want to make sure like, you guys know this, like the tobacco settlement went awry, lack of a better word, right? It went to general coffers and whatnot. This can't go that way, right? This, this is a very pointed settlement for the damage that's been done for people with opioid abuse. It has to go back to that. Right. Right, I understand yeah. the 40,000 for what appears to be like mental health talk. That 38, we just, we just gotta make sure it goes where it has to go. Well, no, do we also have any at least I guess we don't have anything in place because it's so new, but mechanism for measuring the effectiveness of the program to justify future you know, dedications of money. I mean, if Mindy comes up with something else that she really wants to spend it on, how are we going to decide if this is still our best use of the dollars? That'll be something that Mindy will have to figure out how she's going to measure the effectiveness and know what the best use of the money is. Yeah, a lot of the metrics for that are kid testimonials about how the program has helped them. Uh, and some of them are quite powerful in terms of the ones that I've read. Plus, this is not kind of the first time this program's been rolled out. So ultimately, the Board of Education is going to measure that. And part of the, I guess, confidence we had in making the decision was the success of the program at the high school. So my guess is that trying this out at the middle school actually makes very good sense. And maybe it's not directly like to purely opioid substance abuse, right. but as sort of a precursor treatment that would help kids get their minds around their current circumstances and maybe avoid that in the future. There's a lot of evidence that suggests these sort of interventionist programs uh, uh, prevent that sort of thing from happening. So I, I was comfortable mm -hmm. doing it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thanks, John. Yeah. Okay, I entertain a motion to transfer $78,554.50 from the opioid settlement account to uh, program services. Rob moves. Taylor seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. And whenever this grant comes in every year in the future, Jen, it'll always need to be appropriated. Right, we right? can't spend it without it being appropriated. Got it. And it comes in in pieces, so we kind of wait, you know, wait for it to accumulate to a reasonable amount. So we're not coming through every time we get four thousand dollars. Sure. Are these funds because some of them are over one year? 
Are we putting it into a separate? It's in a grant fund. Grant fund. Mm -hmm. A multi-year grant fund. So it can continue. It's not just going into a budget general fund. No, nope. multi-year grant fund. Thank you. And, and this grant fund, does this only collect this specific grant? This or? set of, it has its own set of accounts within the, the grant. Perfect. Fund. Okay. Good question, Jack. Um, okay, next is 18, discuss to take action to accept anticipated donations of up to 150000 um, to the beautification Adopt the Garden program. So last night, this was on the Board of Selectmen agenda, and they did not make a um, decision on it. I think they want some more information and continuing discussion. So at this time, there is nothing for you to take action on. Okay. So I'd entertain a motion to table this um, until the Board of Selectmen finishes their review. Rob moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Discuss and take action. On an appropriation bond authorization for repair of Gorham's Pond Dam in the amount of three million three hundred forty-five thousand nine hundred dollars. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Darren Ostefan, I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works, also known as Ed's Assistant. We were before the Board of Selectmen last night, and they did entertain um, our request. So. Um, Everybody's familiar with Gorms Pond Dam. It was damaged on September 1st during Storm Ida in 2021. Major storm occurred during low tide, so the water coming over the dam um, was extra pounded the front of the dam. It, it created a lot of turbulence and removed all the stones, displaced all the armoring, and exposed the soft core of the dam. So uh, we immediately brought a consultant on board um, for their advice and to pursue FEMA funding. Um, and on April 21st, 2022, we uh, came up with a temporary repair in-house. Um, we sought and received Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy and um, uh, DEEP. So. Um, we, we saw and got their approval for an emergency repair. Um, we saw competitive bids, hired a couple contractors. We, uh, the repair basically consisted of installing filter fabric to cover the soft core of the dam, provide extra stone on the surface to provide ballast and armoring against the ebb and flow of the tide. Uh, we Got, we received our Army Corps of Engineer and DEP permits for the permanent repair of the dam in 2023. On May 13, 2024, we received a bid um, to do the work, to actually do the work. Uh, we, throughout all of this, we continued, continued to meet with FEMA. Um, we had multiple meetings in the field, remote um, conference calls in pursuit of uh, funding. We're seeking 100% funding. Uh, we do not have a commitment to fund letter from them. That will not be provided. Uh, what else could I say? They, they won't even, um, they won't pay us until the project is over and all the costs are known. We also have until October 2025 to complete the project in order to be eligible for the FEMA funds. That includes uh, an extension that was requested and granted. Uh, the start date of the project, um, well, we, we are allowed, we have restrictions with our DEEP permit. We are only allowed to do in-water work um, after September 30th up to April 1st. Now, um, if we do sheet piling and we enclose the area of, of work, um, we can get away with working in the warmer months. But um, right now, we have not issued a notice of award because we don't have the money. As soon as we get a notice of, uh, as soon as we get the money, we'll, it, we'll 
have a pre-construction meeting and issue a notice of award to the contractor and we'll nail down the schedule better hopefully um, traffic we don't plan on taking up too much traffic on the bridge there will be times when there will be alternating traffic uh, the contractor will most likely install sheet piling that means there'll be a crane on the bridge to drive the sheet piling on both sides of the bridge to encapsulate the area where we're going to work um, that'll be during the day only and with police protection and we'll work out the details of that as we get a contractor on board and find out the the method of work that they propose duration of the project uh, someplace between 9 and 11 months and uh, we're hopeful that the, the contractor will do better than that and that's about it any questions when uh, Darren would you say that it had to be finished by what's that when did the project have to be finished by October 2025 so if we put this out now we'll be kind of bumping right up against it right yes that nine to twelve months that, that's correct and if we go a day over that, is there an ability to extend to ensure we can still receive the grant? Yes, there, there is an ability to extend. I, they've told us that um, this is the last extension we're going to get, but um, without being too disparaging towards FEMA, um, we spent a lot of time preparing for and answering uh, for, for them to review it. and. It might take months for them to um, finish a review in one of their departments. And then they'll, we'll get notice of what their comments are and we'll have a week to respond or a, a few days, maybe do it by Tuesday. Um, and we do, uh, we respond immediately. Um, so what I'm, I'm trying to get to and, and answering your question is, um, I, I would hope for some sort of leniency since the review process is not within our control and we have um, we can demonstrate that we have been responding in a timely manner throughout the entire process so if we thought about whether we should I mean when I look at this project I mean the project is a project I'm not going to pine on how much it costs to fix a dam and um, and the bridge foundations and so forth, but I think given the size, given the amount over $3 million and the fact that we, we think there's a relatively clear path to be reimbursed by FEMA for the work, you know, have, have we, are we very comfortable with the process, what we need to do and check all the boxes and the timing and meet everything to receive that grant? Because, you know, I'd hate to have like a footfall you know, in timing or anything like that. Is there anything else we should be doing to make sure that this very lucrative grant that we that we can have access to, that there's no risk in it, from from the actions on our side? Oh, no, there's no risk. There's we are doing everything that we can. Um, there's always a risk. Um, they they have told us that when the project's over, we're going to review everything um, and that's when we decide what's going to be eligible. We've also been told you're eligible for 100 percent. So we're, we're very hopeful we've done everything that we're supposed to do and we're going to continue to do that. We, our consultant continues to uh, contact them on a regular basis. Is there anything you need? How's the review going? Um, and the way it works it goes from one department to the next department and not really sure why it goes through so many departments, but I know that we respond continually and that um, our consultant has also been prompting them to make sure that we move it along as fast as we can. Darren, is the, con is the consultant part of the construction company or separate? Will the consultant, consultant be a part of the construction no, no. process? Is, is that person the person that's helping us kind of guide along in the FEMA process, are they, do they work for the construction company or are they associated oh, with no. them? Oh, no, 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 they work for our consultant. 
So um, they were hired on early. As soon as we, as soon as this happened, we immediately um, went for FEMA funding. And uh, they're also the consultant that was responsible for the construction design and permitting, which was, you can see from the timeline, no small feat. The dam was damaged in 2021, and we're coming up on 2024, September. So it, most of that time was eaten up with talking to FEMA, getting permits from the DEP, making applications to the Army Corps of Engineer. Okay. Uh, on the cost here, you know, the bid results were from May of 2024. That dollar amount, right, that was the best result inside the bid? We only had one bidder. Okay. And how long is that bid good for? So if we were, if we approve this and RTM approves it, you know, the next month or so, is this, yeah, can we still hit that bid? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, because another thing that we've been doing is since that time, speaking with our contractor. Uh, certainly the contractor has a right to walk away from this job if he has other stuff to do. Um, we can't just expect him to hold his price and allocate his resources and time for this job unless we can give him a definitive time when he would do it. And here we are. Um, so in the meantime, we've had plenty of conversations with our contractor, our, our bidder, and um, they've indicated that they have the bandwidth to do this. Um, they have, they're big <coughs> enough, they can move people around. They're interested in doing this job and they are not interested in walking away. They want, uh, they want to do the job. And no change in the price, so. No change in the price. So the expectation no is if the RTM approves this thing in 30 days or so, right, that you guys would sign the contract and move and get to work right away? Yep, yes, that's why we bid it. Um, we're looking forward to issuing a notice of award and trying to figure out um, the schedule and how it's gonna work through the winter, hope for good weather, et cetera. Yeah, that's our intent. Jim, for information purposes, the RTM meets on the 23rd, and if you put in that silly 14-day thing. 10 day. What? It's a 10 day. So it's 10 days, then we would be able to, it would be clear in the uh, first week of October. I just want to say thank you to whoever got the uh, lawyer's opinion on the lease agreement. Yeah, yeah the, the, mem the memo was very helpful, so thank you to Wayne and, and the team. Okay, any other questions for Darren or Ed or John? Anything you want to add that we should? Oh, I recommend approval. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Jim, can I ask a question? Since it's finally all set up. I think Jack asked your question. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, Jack. That's all right. Can I, can I go up and ask a question on the uh, final? Sure. Yep. Is the bond resolution in here? Yeah. Um, the first. Jack Davis, 197 Hoyt Street. Um, so this project, and I'm going to use the round numbers, is $3.4 million. Um, initially, let's assume that it's coming out of the general fund. But and it's going to take a year to complete, so let's just assume we make the October um, deadline. Based upon prior experience with dealing with FEMA, it could be another two to maybe three years before we're ever going to see a penny. So in the interim, unless we're taking that out of the general fund and we're just holding those funds out, I'm assuming at some time this is being rolled into another bond issue that the Board of Finance would authorize. But let's just say we get back the $3.4 million. So under that circumstance, we have a bound outstanding. Two years down the road, we have $3.4 million. And there's several options that could occur. One is, is that you can try to um, reduce the bonds, but typically the buyback is five years, if I'm not mistaken. So that's not going to work. The other thing is, is that can be reallocated to other projects because we've now had that money. My concern from the RTM perspective is 
would those projects that get reallocation still have to come before the RTM? Or is it just considered authorized funds that can be used? So, do you mind? Okay. Yeah, I'm asking. <laughs> I'm asking. So, the way it would work is, you're right, first we'd spend it out of the general fund um, for cash flow purposes. And then because we are anticipating the grant, rather than issue it as bonds, <coughs> in order to, so we have three years from the first expenditure before we actually have to fund You'd issue do bands? something. We would do bands okay. in anticipation of the grant funds. If for some reason FEMA took so long that we run through our cycles of being able to roll bands and we have to start either permanently financing or paying down, and we bond, say we bond $3 million, and then FEMA gives us $3 million. The way the allocation process, the reallocation process works is it can only go to another project that has already been approved for, for bonding. So HHR, um, rather than borrow more for HHR, we would just transfer unused bond proceeds. It no, already that, has to be approved for that, bonding. That's important because at the end of the day, I have to explain this to the RTM, and that was the one outstanding part um, in the memo that I wasn't sure of, but thank you. Yep. And Jen, in terms of another project that had already been approved, it's another project that had been approved before the bonding or before the reallocation of the funds? Before the reallocation. Okay. So if we bond in year one and then three years later we have to reallocate, it just needs to be a project that was... That's an active authorization at that yes. time. It could have been as of like a week before that, mm -hmm. right? Okay. But all of those would have gone through yeah. the RTM anyway, so Correct. it already has approval, so that works fine. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so as you guys know here, we're a bonding resolution. The bonding resolution is both an appropriation and a bonding resolution, the land permits us to only, I guess, Jen, the right word is long-term finance it with bonds. Yes. So if we were to receive a grant, we would have to then go back and appropriate the grant to cover this, and we would then cancel the bonding authorization, right? Uh, yes, because we don't have an actual grant amount yet. Got it. And if we get something less than the three, say we get two million as grants, we bond 1.3, we'd have two million as grant. Got it. And the applicable paragraph here, as you guys all remember from Great Island and so forth, is section one that really governs what we can use the bond proceeds for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let me take that back. You wouldn't have to appropriate the grant because it, it would just be another funding source for this um, by appropriating this project if we get that FEMA grant, it cannot be used on anything other than reimbursing this project. So you don't have to appropriate it because there's no discretion. In so only if grants go into the general fund to renew. Yep. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion for a, to appropriate $3,345,900 for the cost to repair Gorham's Pond Dam and authorize the issuance of bonds and notes in the amount of $3,345,900 to meet said appropriation. Paul moves, Rob seconds. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Darren, Ed, Jen, Jack, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next item here is um, discuss and take action on an appointment of a vacancy on the Board of Finance um, to replace um, the vacancy that was created by the, by the passing of um, David Martin. I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn executive session for discussion con for a discussion concerning the appointment pursuant to Connecticut General Statute Section 206A. Paul moves. Rob seconds. All those in favor? Okay. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. I entertain a motion to return um, into public session. Or oh, sorry. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn from the executive session and return to public session. Rob moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? It's unanimous. We're now back in public session. So uh, item 20 on our, uh, on our discussion was to um, discuss and take action on an appointment of a, to fill the vacancy created by um, David Martin's passing. Um, uh, Milan Gasserud was um, unanimously nominated by the, the by the DTC um, 
we met with her, you know, like the session to kind of talk and so forth. Um, Milan has served on the on F and B before that for the library, a lot of different roles in town and so forth. And I, um, I think she'd be a great candidate. And so I would make a motion that we appoint uh, Milan Gesserud as the uh, to fill the vacancy created by David Martin. Milan. <laughs> Second. Um, second. Okay. Second. I think Robin. Uh, I made the motion. Second. second. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Welcome on boards. And I would also um, just mention that Dan was unable to be here. He's actually traveling to Michigan, and he um, asked me to kind of express uh, his, you know, um, significant public support for you joining as well. So uh, next steps for you, I think Krista will return later this week. Um, we'll just need you to be sworn in, and I'll then you become. Oh, okay. Right, I'll, I'll come tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So the uh, next item is to appoint a board of finance representative to the uh, HHR building committee. Um, you know, I, I've uh, spoken to spoken to Rob about you know his ability to 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 fill that vacancy um, and also spoken to you know to Jill and Chris Price about sort of what they felt that they needed and so forth and um, it's it's a big capital project it's actually the largest one ever I think this town has undertaken um, you know through a combination of these three and you know I would um, I would nominate Rob to fill um, to fill that vacancy is there a second? Yes. yes. Okay, <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> we actually. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Great. Unanimous. Thank you for. First meeting tomorrow, FYI, for the group. Okay. Or first meeting for me, sorry. That's some big shoes. Okay. So, two items left. The first, the first one is going to be to discuss funding guidance for large capital projects. Jen, do you want to give a little background on this? Or? Yeah. Um, we talked about this last month during agenda review. I think we brought up four items. This was one of them. And what we're trying to do is make the process more efficient so that when the Board of Selectmen put forward something that is not obviously going to be funded from a special appropriation or obviously funded from bonding, how do we want to proceed so that it doesn't come through as one funding source and then you guys make the decision on the funding source it has to go back for approval um, just in my mind I was thinking I don't know maybe five hundred thousand to three million dollars seems like where those projects would fall that's kind of the size that I was thinking of um, I did reach out to bond council Jim had proposed the idea of if Board of Selectmen could approve both funding sources and then when it comes to you you kind of pick and choose so I have reached out to Bond Council. She thinks it's um, it would be doable if we make some revisions to the wording in our bond authorizations. Um, but I haven't pursued it any further because I wanted to wait until this board weighed in on how you might approach that. The other option is we can do something similar to what we did with fire apparatus, where I think we said anything over $500,000, assume it's bonded, so those items come through to you as a bonding authorization because that's the most likely um, funding source and then if it were to change and be switched to a special appropriation it would have to go back yeah. and, I, and I guess maybe just one thing to remind everybody of, like when you work backwards when the RTM actually appropriates you know a capital project if they appropriate it from bonding they're only appropriating it from bonding we cannot use dollars in the general fund to effectively long-term pay for that project. It needs to be bonding. And if they approve it from capital, if, and we send it forward and it's approved by capital, we can't, we can't actually bond for it. So, you know, where this becomes a little bit relevant is like in, um, if you think about things, you know, items that may be on the edge during budget, during, um, during the budget cycle, we may want to, in order to get the mill rate where we want and use the right amount of funds in terms of drawdown from the general fund, we may choose for a million dollar item to be, we want to pay cash for it, or we may want to bond for it. 
I'm just using like a million as something that's sort of on, might be like on the fence. So if we wanted to bond for it to drive the tax level to this, well then, and it came to us via a cash payment, we would need to send it back to the Board of Selectmen, have them approve the bonding, and then it would be able to go to the RTM. And you know, the, the Board of Selectmen, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, it's when they're like sending something to us, they're approving it, and they're also saying how they want it to be funded. So I think the ability to fund it either way, if, if we can work something into the bond resolution where it gives us the ability to kind of choose A or B, would prevent us from, you know, like the last night or the, or the, or the mm -hmm. Tuesday before we set it, having to make a decision and then send it back to the Board of Selectmen and not knowing whether they would approve it one way or another, like when we're setting the mill rate. So that's why we thought exploring a sort of, a little bit of a, a flexible bond resolution might be a path. Yeah, I, <clears throat> having now served on both of these boards, uh, I really do think the thinking in terms of bonding or pulling something out of, funding something out of the general fund really should, that analysis should be done with this board. So I'm certainly in favor of us trying to adopt a mechanism where we, we're not punting our responsibility. We're just saying, look, you guys really need to make that decision. I think it's particularly important at the end of a budget process where you guys are looking at the total budget picture and trying to make mill rate decisions. Uh, you may take a look at the mill rate that pops out of this model and decide that uh, you want to bond more or less or take more or less out of the uh, fund balance. And so making sure that we've structured what we pass along to you uh, in such a way that you have the flexibility to do that and don't have to actually have come back to this board to uh, resort that or get that reapproved makes a lot of sense. The one thing I want to uh, in interject into this is that it's quite frequent during the budget process that we'll approve something and it gets fed into the model and there's a discussion of a mill rate when the reality is is that's probably going to be bonded or we haven't made a uh, had a specific uh, sort of point of view as to whether we think should, something should be bonded that's why i like the 500 to 300 three million dollar guidance somewhere in there we ought to try to make that even more precise so that we can come in and say okay as a straw man, if you will, for a particular budget process, we're going to say all these projects, we'll just assume that those are going to get bonded uh, in the budget that we do and that we send to you guys. It's not so you can't change that and we'll vote in the appropriate resolution that allows you to do that. But I just don't like having the budget where all that stuff is put into operating expense when we know two, three, four million dollars is going to be pulled out of that and uh, bonded. The other thing that Jennifer and I were talking about is we're going to approve the Board of Selectmen budget, but we're going to be silent on mill rate implications, bonding of all of that kind of stuff. We're just going to come and say these are all the revenues, these are all the costs, these are all the debt service, all that stuff that comes out of our side of the ledger. We're going to say what that's it, that is, and we're going to be silent on the mill rate. That's really your job, and she's got the model that runs all that. So we're not going to be, none of that's going to come out of or precipitate out of our budget discussion. Thank you. So. So I, I think, you know, based on the memo you put together, then do we want to, um, you know, should we be giving, should we be giving guidance? I is think it's it still helpful to give guidance. It is. Do you, not that we would hold you to it, um, but do you have a, as a board, a dollar amount in mind that you think is, kind of where that threshold is where you're more likely to bond versus more likely to do a special appropriation. So uh, I would throw out a million. If something if something uh, uh, costs a million dollars and it has a sort of, and it's an item and it, with a useful life of more than five years, to me that feels like it's solidly in the camp of something we're more likely to bond than not. Could it, it, could, could it go a little bit lower, like 750 or 500? But I felt like, that, and if it's something that we have, you know, kind of consistently mm -hmm. bonded in the past. You know, fire trucks obviously are one of those with, I think the, the engines are now like in the 800, $850,000 mm -hmm. range and so forth. We've been bonding those. And, right. You know, it depends if we need to do kind of two or three of those in a year. Well, then maybe you might want to think about bonding one or two. But I think it, and it always depends on what else is bondable. But it, 
kind of felt like that million dollar number and in, in north of five years okay um because that's the overlap with the budget guidance too like john was talking about that we can start to assume that as the board of selectmen build their budget i think that'll be helpful let's just try it i mean we can adjust it i think right. that's a good starting point is there any reason not to go down to 500 just to maximize flexibility <laughs> yeah, I think it's too late. So but is well, it hard? Well, I mean, we're just there may be some things that you might combine, right? Because exactly. they're similar expenditures. Right, right. Well, these seven things add up to two million. Let's just go ahead and That's bond them and bond that, right? But I think the main thing is set a general parameter. If it looks like there's an exception, we'll have a dialogue. There's lots of meetings and lots of meetings <coughs> for that. Let's just try that threshold. That at least gives us something to uh, preliminarily slot in to either operating expense or bonding. And then let you guys take a look. And take it so, John, are you thinking a million? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so maybe a million, a million of a project yep. or, or, or group of like related projects? Related, yeah. Related expenses that add up to mm -hmm. a million plus. And as a board, how do you feel about the idea of trying to see if we can get wording that can be in one approval for the Board of Selectmen that still gives you the, the flexibility? Do you, wanna, do you want me to pursue that with? Bond council and see what that would look like. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you guys should have. Yeah. I, I think if it if it if it said you know we hereby appropriate you know one million dollars for this project to be paid for either from the general fund or with the application of bond proceeds, but not e not both. Right. We we want to make sure we're not well, duplicating. We express a preference, but the language in there should be that it's. Board of Finance's decision, ultimate decision to pick. Right, and I think what we would want is, so normal bonding resolution, the exact same resolution moves through Board of Select and Board of Finance, RTM. Um, yeah. And I think what we would want is that a selection is made at this board so that when it goes to the RTM, they're not approving something that you go, yeah, you know what, maybe we'll go this way or that yeah. way. I think RTM would want to know what is the funding source that's being selected. We have to know. Yeah. So I, I'll work with Marie to make sure that it's something that can be decided at this level, but still have the same document or, you know, what we need to do to <coughs> have it go through all three. So the only uh, no selection, you know, two options at Board of Selectmen. You make the decision here, and only the one option goes to RTM. Yeah, the only question I had about that is that the Board of Selectmen will vote to do a particular bond resolution and that would go to you guys and you would vote on that those two resolutions are identical so if they're going to introduce language in there that gives you the option to pick is that the same bond resolution that you would vote for or is it slightly different language could you struck out the part that says we're going to do cash for example we just got to make sure that the way they yep. orchestrate this wording doesn't result in a modified bond resolution that you guys end up passing that still has to come back to us. Exactly. I think that's yeah. what the complication is. It's easy to come up with the wording. So maybe there's an addendum. I don't know what they're going to come up with, but I'm certainly in favor of giving you all the flexibility to decide, which as a practical matter is kind of always how it has been. We just need to codify it. John, can I ask a question? Because you're using the term general fund. The reality is we have three options on capital especially during the bonding process. We can bond, we can use general fund funds, or we can tax. And so when you're using general fund, are you saying that that also means tax for it? Well, the taxes ultimately yeah. support both. So. Okay, yeah. I just want to, because. Well, the reason you general fund is because that's, that's how you would say, if you're gonna pull something. Okay, I just want to know. Or if you're going to do it in the part of, as part of the budget process. Yeah, check the taxes all go into the general no, fund, I, I and then we need to appropriate them out. It's, it's yep. a fair distinction, though. But, I but don't know. because there are some million dollar projects that, based upon what our current grant list is, it's 10 basis points essentially to our tax rate. And some of those uh, would not be in favor of bonding. I would say, let's tax for it, get it done, it's a one year hit, and move it out. Um, so, as opposed to taking that million and rolling it up into things. The distinction that I was just saying on the fire engines are rather than allocating that in taxes and moving it into the general fund, since we are now paying 25% one year in and the remaining 75% 
two years after that, so three years out, it still gives us an option three years from now to do a, another appropriation, rescind the bond, do another appropriation and pay cash, but we haven't tied it up in allocated money in a, in a um, capital account. So by bonding it, it gives the town some options, at least on the fire issues. But there are some million dollar projects yeah. that I'm, you know, while you're having that discussion, but Jack, if, if you might actually say, can't we just tax it? If we approve a million dollar bonding for a fire for a fire truck and we pay twenty five percent per year for four years or something, yeah, you know, right. like over, over that, and on the fourth year we decide to pay cash for it and not actual bond for it, yeah, I think general, correct me if I'm wrong, but we would need to go back to the RTM, yes, to get the million dollars appropriated, yes, from the general yeah, fund. This is something that to, Jen yeah. and I have talked about, but it gives us a three year window without trying to allocate. I'm not maybe using the right words, but because it's authorized but an issue, mm -hmm. we're not doing allocated or assigned funds on that um, sitting in a um, capital account. So that gave us a little bit more flexibility because unlike many of the other projects where we're actually working on it, you do a million dollar project within 12 months of the spent. This is going to take three years before we're making the final thing on the final. So, but yes, a million dollars is good, just as long as there's the flexibility during the time that you're having your budget discussion to say, maybe we should just tax for this instead of just blanket bonding. And would we need to change that option when that resolution comes to the RTM? Because whatever they decide, they being the Board of Finance, the RTM is, doesn't want to have that option that Right, yeah, just the one. Yeah, we want to We would send to you a singular, either right. approve a bond resolution or a sort of a capital, you know, right, right. capital if budget. They're going to do that. My point was, if you do that, then the resolution you end up passing is slightly different in terms of wording than what we passed, because we're giving you the optionality. I mean, maybe the way they do it is we pass two resolutions and you pick one. Or I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the, the idea yeah. is for it to not be modified and require going back anywhere in the process. Right, right, okay, fully agree. Okay, so I guess to formalize it, um, entertain a motion to set the Board of Fans guidance that we provide to the Board of Selectmen that for projects that are over $1 million, $1 million or over, and have a useful life of five years or greater, or combination of related projects that meet those criteria, you know, we're, we're, our guidance would be that we would expect to bond that, and it would come to us in the bonding resolution, provided that, Jen, if we can get these changes made, it would come to us, you know, in sort of a modified. It's a very interesting motion. Oh, no, I, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. it's okay. it'll come to us in a modified, you know, resolution that we can then choose, right? <laughs> so that you'll work on, right? Yes. So let's just entertain a motion to set our okay. guidance at one million <laughs> or more with five years of useful life or more. Tell it moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? Okay. I need Siri for those kind of resolutions, huh? Okay, next item is, and the last one is to discuss um, budget guidance. So this was another one that was briefly um, discussed during agenda review um, last month. And you know, historically, there's been the idea of budget guidance from the Board of Finance Chairman to the Town and Board of Education. But where the conversation went last month was, um, you know, should there be budget guidance? What should the timing be? Um, is it useful? Is it appropriate? How would it be conveyed? Those types of comments. Concepts. And then if we do want to continue to provide guidance from the Board of Finance to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Ed, um, there should be a formalized method for developing that and proving it. Into the Are we looking for opinions? What? Are we looking for opinions? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's a role on? to be played. I mean, I think that the guidance is good, but I do think it would be helpful just to kind of you know, cover ourselves to discuss it formally before we give it. Yeah, I agree with that. 
I, I think it's helpful to have guidance, right? Um, it signals sort of where our head is at and what we're going to be aiming for at sort of at the end of the tunnel. You know, we don't control how the guidance is used, right? Or if it's used, right? And because we don't control the underlying policy that's setting the individual operating budgets and so forth. But I do think having that out there in terms of where we think things should end up is helpful. Now, in terms of what we need to guide to, right? Ultimately, it's a combination of mill rate increase. Probably makes sense to guide to where we think the appropriate mill rate increase could be, and it'll be based on kind of what's happening in the grand list. I think it helps to guide to um, where we think we should be maintaining the general fund sort of unassigned balance, like let's call it liquidity, right? Whether we're going to be targeting, you know, 15% of our old number or X percent of the new Moody's number, right? And I think it's helpful to give guidance around, you know, operating budget increases. All the things you have done in putting these numbers together in the past, but we just haven't made yeah. more transparent and public. So we'll just do that publicly now. Yeah. I mean, in, in the past, if you look at, you know, the pages that I've given over the last three or four years and John for a few years before that, it was always, you know, generally sort of discussed operating budgets because those were always by, by, by far the largest budgets, right? And it's always broken down between, you know, sort of core you know, the same thing we delivered last year and then sort of new initiatives, right? Um, so I think we could set it up that way, but I, I do think we should think about tax rate, we should think about use of fund balance, we should talk about sort of where operating is. And then I, I also think, you know, it, it could make sense to give guidance around any areas that we think people should be digging into, right? And kind of how budgets are construct, constructed, we should, you know, things like always searching for efficiencies. And maybe there are some qualitative things that we believe should be part of the budget guidance rather than just, you know, quantitative. Agreed. About that financial report. What? <laughs> I have one other question. That? What are your thoughts on timing? Because um, I think the Board of Ed starts their process even before ours, but we kick off our process in mm -hmm. October. Um, so if you do it at the state of the town, you deliver it. It's pretty you know, yeah. far into the process. Yeah, I think we should. Well, the Board of Ed budgets usually, the books are printed and sitting in the office on December 1st. <laughs> So when I'm giving the guidance, the second Tuesday, <laughs> exactly the second Monday in December, yeah, the books were already they late the public short. It almost mm -hmm. feels like we should finalize something by the October board of finance meeting. You know, it's generally the third, either the second or third Tuesday in. If we're going to put something together, we should do it by then. Maybe even September, right? I mean, I'm, I'm up for it earlier the better. But I was just throwing I was throwing October out there. September, October works. I was asked to put my budget timeline together today. So how will we talk about it at our next meeting? Finalize it in October. Right. We'll kind of have a little bit of a, a, a working item on our agenda, and we'll vote on it in our October meeting. Yep. And I have an idea of maybe sort of 10 things that we should probably have as we, as we discuss that, right? Like things like, Jen, like what's happened to the grand list? From last October to this October, mm -hmm. you know, directionally, yeah, you know, maybe any guidance from planning and zoning in terms of where any big projects that may kind of come on line to kind of make a significant movement to that. Um, reviewing our our fund balance, right, where it closed out like this year, and how much we expect, assuming no more surpl surpluses, no. You know, assuming any known allocations that we may need to kind of take out of the general fund during the year, this is how much we think we could, might have left in it. I think last year we, we applied three million, give or take, and we were directionally six million above the Moody's limit. 
So we, we basically took half of what we had. So maybe if we, Jen, you get some information around, you know, around fund balance and where we are in our, the Moody's and our own policy. So yeah. in September, do you want to have this information available or in September when you have a fuller board, do you want to talk about what information you want to gather? I think it'd be helpful to have that information available for September. And maybe we add to that list, like any any recent contracting. Let's take our big five contracts on the town side and the big two on the school side. Let's just remind ourselves of what's kind of baked into those contracts. And maybe if we have all those things sort of in front of us in the September meeting, and um, you all reach out to John and you all kind of anything else that we think we need to pull together so we can maybe have a hearty conversation on about it on September, maybe run some more calculations and so forth between September and vote on it in October. Yes. We have enrollment, any enrollment data that comes by then? Like number of kids that showed up? Yeah, we'll, we'll know whether. For some reason, I'm thinking that's October. For in, like new enrollment information is that usually as of October? Yes. Exactly. October 1st. Yeah. I think they would know, they should know in October August 1st. when they open the doors, right? Mm -hmm. But you report to the state October oh, 1st. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I think if you give a range of aggregate budget increases, who knows, two, four, six, eight, this is the implication on the mill rate. And then we can we can make it transparent to the taxpayer, but we can also, as a board, indicate, you know, this is unacceptable and this is too low. As I, I used to call it, fiscal anorexia. And this is the sweet spot where we can work together. Good, good idea. And then to maybe add to that, let's look at like the last 10 years of actual budget increases from year to year and maybe in approved approved budgets year after year. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that for the Board of Ed, let's look at that for Board of Selectmen. Okay. And and in any of those ten years, if we could highlight were there extraordinary expenses that had to be encountered, like in COVID or perhaps this doesn't fall into it because it's capital, but like the repairs down at the Gorm's Pond Dam. Yeah. yeah. Well, even um, like the recreation, when we did bump up the budget after COVID, you know, I think we want to pull that out uh, as an yeah. outlier. Right. Yeah. Well, good point. Yes. It, well, maybe particularly on the Board of Eds, the Board of Selectmen side, maybe we should look at any material. Are there certain revenues we should be tracking, like net contribution from Parks and Rec program revenue? Because on the board of selectmen side, that um, some of those net against expenses, right? The board of ed really just has one revenue well, that, that nets against their budget. We don't but, get but, the net revenues, but also but the they have to be distinct. With respect to that, take into account grants, the excess cost reimbursement on the special ed side has been all over, and. Not that we should have we should have some idea so we can have a meaningful con conversation with the board of ed as to where that should be. So maybe the board of based, based, based on their based on their student population in special ed and uh, what they hear from the uh, uh, Connecticut Board of Education. Okay, a lot of these stats I, I, I put in the state of the town where we track here's population, here's gross expenditures, here's grant, but I think having that together you know, when we're looking at that would be helpful. So I can definitely pull together the Board of Selectmen side, but I would ask that you reach out to the Board of Ed for any information that you want from them and get it directly from them instead of yeah. pulling mm -hmm. through a middleman. Very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Ten seconds. 
You know, one of the things that F and B has been talking about on this is that if you start to look at the operating budgets and how they've been increasing, the fact of the matter is there's a cost for running this town and delivering the services that we expect. And yes, there should be always looking for efficiencies, whether it's not we're picking up our own special ed buses. That has to be done sooner than the last minute. But we shouldn't be masking the fact that our operating budgets are averaging 5% over, as an example over the last couple of years, but our, but our mill rate, we're trying to manage to a mill rate of 2.5% increase, and I think that's part of what you were um, alluding to, Paul. If it's costing us 5% to deliver, the taxpayers should know this is what it costs to have the town services delivered of what you expect. So that's the other aspect of it, is that I know we all want to keep a low mill rate, but we also want to have a realistic view of what it's really costing to run this town and run <coughs> the schools. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Uh, you want to do a, a quick financial report review? <laughs> I can be very brief. Okay. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, so page one of the financial report gives you the year-end summary. Um, we haven't, we've closed out, but we haven't done all of our final journal entries. We'll be turning over our books to the auditors um, September 16th. So what we have right now is a positive result of operations of 2.7 million, um, which is more than we expected. Um, we were a little conservative when we drew down fund balance, but what's really driving this is investment income. We're over $3.1 million better than budget on that. Um, I think the caveat on that is we have a high number in there again. At some point, rates are going to drop, and we will not make our budget number. <laughs> um, whether it's this year, next year, at some point it's going to happen. Um, so that's not going to be an ongoing thing. But overall, we're looking at moving from the fund balance from about $30.8 million to $33.6 million. And that 33.6 is 19.36% of the fiscal 25 adopted budget. I haven't put it into what that means in movies world because um, that's really more cash based at the end of the year. Um, so I haven't found an easy way of throwing that all together, but it's a work in progress. Um, but bottom line, we're adding a significant amount to fund balance. Um, pages or page two gives you the um, year-end look at our sewer operating fund, parking fund, rec program fund, and Great Island management, all of which ended with um, surpluses. And rec program fund actually sent back um, two hundred ninety-five thousand dollars to the general fund because that one we bring down to zero at the end of the year. And how does that compare to other years? Well, we've only had the fund a couple years. We budgeted to 80 because that's roughly what we sent back over the first year we had the fund, so it's a little better than what we had in, prior, in the prior year. Um, and then offhand, I don't remember what the delta tended to be. I think it was usually around 250. Pages 3 through 9 give you detail on revenues and expenses, revenues by line item, expenses by department um, or division within larger departments. So if you're interested in those details, it's there. Um, contingency accounts, we ended up with balances in there. General contingency, we're at about $105,000 and we'll have about $181,000 in capital contingency. But I'll be bringing, in the fall, I'll be bringing you capital flows out, so that should go up a little bit. So that's pretty, I mean, sorry, what page are you on? Some kind of that is page 11. Yes, okay, so, yeah, I mean, we spent a lot, right? We're at, we started at 650 down to 181. Yeah, we had a lot of appropriations out of capital reserve this and year. Remind me how new money gets put in there? When we close out capital projects, anything that was unspent, we move it up to capital reserve and then um, it comes back down. So it used to be a lot higher, and you've done a good job of keeping it reasonable. Obviously, we needed a bunch of it this year. Like, mm -hmm. what if we need that again this year? We're not going to have it. 
No, but uh, you know, the big item on there was the DPD locker room and the PD, uh, the mini splits, the nitrogen system, those building repairs. And I think we have a better process in place to make sure that those get into the, ca the capital budget rather than having to be mid-year appropriations. Okay. Yeah, I think that's like the key, right? You know, things are always going to come up, but we yeah. want as much as possible going through the budget process. Yeah. Um, really nothing of interest on active bonded projects. I was just what, looking at the, just wondering like on the the engines page, like page 24, which is page 14. Mm -hmm. um, like starting top left. I mean, I kind of vaguely remember that there's no date on there. I mean, there's no dates in the lower left. Nothing, no action. Like, I'm just wondering how long have some of these um, been out there? So, the NHFD engine, we do have an expenditure now, and I should put the first expenditure date in there. But that's kind of what um, Jack was talking about, where there's a long lead time from when they actually place the order to when we first make a payment. So, they have orders placed for these vehicles. It's just a long time, it can take up to two years to build, and then there's just prog a couple of progress payments as they're being built. Can we maybe add to this, just because like this one has no dates, like when we originally passed the bond resolution? Yeah. Does that make sense? That would be good. Or you don't need to go, maybe just for new ones? Yeah. Um, some of them are a little weird because there's multiple um, okay. resolutions, but let me think about that. And Jen, in, in Oxford, when do we think we can close that? Because that's $6 million of, of additional. Well, we we're paying another invoice this week. Um, they're trickling in. There's still some encumbrances out there for some expected things. I don't think we've released all the retainage yet. Um, and then there is the state grant closeout process. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully we'll complete the expenditures soon. But to fully close out the project, we, we won't be able to do that until we know the state grant amount and that can take years. So actually, that's on my radar for the next time we bond, we're gonna have to make a decision because we're coming up on another milestone where do we wanna issue bans and roll them? Do we just wanna finance what we think it, you know, any delta that we think we have? Do we wanna just roll the dice and say, if we don't get all the state grant that we get, we'll backstop it with um, general fund because it won't be that significant. We'll have to decide what we want to do. Wait, this is Rock Church? Yeah. You know, we're, we're still spending money down and we're waiting for a state grant. So we just need to, it's just going to have to be trued up, issue. an estimate to true it up while we wait for the final state grant number. But that'll be in the, the spring that we really need to make some decisions or come up with a strategy on that. Because we've got seven, I mean, do we really think we use all seven million of that? I honestly, I don't know what we're holding for retaining. That's going to be a got significant it. percentage. I think it's usually like 5% of um, the construction costs. So okay. it could be sizable. But, you know, we, we may decide that we want to transfer some bond proceeds out and take our chances with it. I think we'll know more in a few months and we'll have to make a decision. But we definitely want to keep those bond proceeds outstanding. That's like an average cost of like 1.4%. Right. So, you know, if if we really think that we have surplus bond proceeds, we'll move them over to HHR. Okay. Um, Great Island acquisition on page 17. We only had $9,600 of expenses in. Um, the July since the last meeting, so it's not moving along very quickly. But you do have Ed's um, detail of his estimates and his expenditures, and then ARPA on page twenty. So the question earlier, we have uh, one point one million unobligated, um, but we did ramp up the spending, we spent $700,000, sorry, yeah, just under $800,000 since the last report. Um, but like I said, we'll push on all the departments over the next month and say, we need plans, otherwise it goes away. 
and we'll put it to something that we know can get done. In the special revenue when we set up in Great Island, we're not flushing that each year like we are. Correct. It, it wasn't um, set up that way. We don't have um, a budgeted revenue to for that to come back in, but that's something we can discuss. It's going the other way now. Yeah. Right, so. But there is a there is a fund balance in there from that's built up over the last year that we've had the leases. Um, but I don't think it would be a bad idea to let it stay in there because there will be ongoing maintenance on the property. Um, and we have lost revenue coming because we have like two we have like two tenants now, right? Right. Yeah. But that's it for financial report. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, last item is to review and approve minutes for. <laughs> What, what's that? Nothing. <laughs> okay, remove, review and approve minutes for July 16, 2024, regular meeting. Um, I do not have any comments. None. Look fine to me. Okay. I accept the motion to approve. Taylor moves. Rob seconds. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Special assignments, I think. Uh, audit material from your side. Uh, audit committee, they're starting, what did you say, September 16th? They'll be back September 16th, so we have their request list and we're working on uploading things to them before the 16th, but that's the official date to turn over our books. Uh, HHR, my first meeting's tomorrow, um, and dispatch negotiations had a meeting today that I could not make, I'll get an update to the board next meeting. So those are my, those are my big three. My only one is the GIAT meeting Great Island three. Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. um, we met once with, um, with our uh, consultants three weeks ago, outlined a plan. We have a meeting tomorrow night at, uh, at six o'clock in this room where they're gonna sort of outline a little bit more detail in terms of the cadence of how we're going to begin to engage the public, um, get the public more access to the land so they can kind of look at it and give us feedback in terms of what they want, what they like, and so forth. So I, I would say you guys are all start getting more information around like surveys and info sessions probably in the next like three to four weeks. Thank you. Okay. Anything pensions? No. Okay. Okay. Nothing on chairman's report. Any new business? No. Agenda review. Have we filled up September already? I think so. Okay. I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Paul moves. Rob seconds. All those in favor? <clears throat> it's unanimous. We stand adjourned.